crunch our time based on other um, things going on in this room. But I'd like to have Dave Wheeler come up. Uh, if you could keep it as condensed as possible, that'd be helpful. So that there's some time for questions and uh, we need to be out of here as close to 10 as possible. Okay. Thank you. I'll try. Thank you for this opportunity. My name's Dave Wheeler. 21 years ago, I developed a mineral specifically for white-tailed deer called Lucky Buck. I manufacture in Hillsdale County, uh, distribute nationwide, and obviously my business is e economically affected by this ban. Uh, I think the economic impact of this industry on the state is a significant argument, but that's not the direction I want to go in my limited time here. I actually want to discuss the so-called sound science behind this uh, feeding and baiting <coughs> ban. The premise is that the deer will congregate around in a, an artificial source, a, a feed or mineral or uh, bait. They'll congregate, they'll have more contact, but I think even more importantly, they will travel to one of these sites, therefore potentially taking a diseased group of deer in contact with another group, increasing the contact, and that's the premise for wanting to avoid that. I would like to politely disagree. I actually think that more sites is the answer rather than less sites. If you have more sources of nutrition, minerals, particularly sodium, you'll have less congregating and less travel distance. And I'll bring out a few examples to try and illustrate that. There was a study done in West Virginia on radio collared deer traveling to a sodium source, which happened to be a brine discharge out of a gas well, traveled up to 5.5 kilometers away from their core area to get to this salt source. There was another study that confirmed almost identical uh, numbers on Isle Royal earlier in the 70s and 80s. There's 22 sodium sources natural sodium sources on Isle Royal, and the moose would travel, especially in the spring, to those sources. If a deer is hungry or starving, he's going to travel for food, and if he's, and he'll travel for water, and he'll travel for sodium. If we're not allowed to feed and bait, he'll try and get that sodium around along our roadsides, and we all know how bad that works out when he tries to do that. The other alternative is the oil and gas well discharges. And according to the DEQ, Michigan has 14,000 gas and oil wells. Most of those have brine discharges. He may go to a cattle operation that has a pasture salt block out in the pasture that he has access to to get his salt. According to Michigan Cattlemen's Association, there's 12,000 cattle operations. And if half of those have salt sources, that makes 20,000 sources. We have 1.6 million deer in the state of Michigan. That's an average concentration of 81 deer for each of those sources, and an average travel distance of 4.8 miles to get to the closest one. We've already illustrated that they're going to travel for those. So in Michigan, I sold about 55,000 buckets of Lucky Buck last year. Trophy Rock probably sold a similar number of rocks. All of our competitors together may be a similar number, so 165,000 more sources plus those 20 makes 185,000 sources. Now instead of 80 deer coming to each site, we have less than nine. Instead of 4.8 miles of travel, we have 0.6 miles between each potential site. There's several studies that are indicated by the DNR in support of the ban, and one of those is a study by Plummer in Wisconsin last year in 2018, and it was, they tested soil samples, water samples, and fecal samples around salt licks. They found prions. I have a few problems with that sound science revolving around that particular study. They had to amplify in order to find even detectable levels of, of CWD prions. But that's not even my biggest complaint. My biggest complaint is that they don't know whether that level is higher than a general level in the landscape because in the study they don't show that they did a control group and any elementary experiment has a control group for comparison. If you would have sampled under that apple tree or on a, in a bedding area and compared the results then it may have been more conclusive. They used eight different sites, salt licks, for their study. Two of those were natural salt licks and, and nine of them were man-made salt licks. 
What would happen if those man-made salt licks because of a feeding bait demand weren't there? What would the concentration have done in the two remaining sites that wouldn't have been, those, those, element, those sites would have almost certainly been higher. Another study that the DNR points to is in Alpena in 2001, they did a baiting study and they compared the contact rates at a bait site versus in the general population. The procedure they used in that experiment was a five gallon bucket of corn dumped in one pile in the dead of winter in Alpena. And then they counted the number of contacts those deer had with each other. It would be a massive number of contacts, especially since the criteria they used for contacts was any deer within three foot of each other. So you can imagine how many contacts they got. Again, my point is similar. More, more feed would have spread those deer out and you would have had less contacts and less potential spread of disease. So the answer is more, not less. It's to allow it, not to take it away. Of the states that have CWD, and I believe there's 26 in the wild, there's four states that I have found. Only four states have complete feeding and baiting bans. There's others with different restrictions in different areas. But they're Colorado, Montana, New York, and Illinois. Colorado has had a ban for the longest of anybody. I believe their ban went in effect in 1992. They have the highest incident of CWD anywhere in the country. Montana has the next highest rate of those four states, and they had the lo next longest ban, and theirs has been banned since 2002. I attended the Senate meeting on Senate Bill 37 a couple of months ago and testified, and I found one of the, test one of the other comments very interesting. One of the senators on the committee brought up that his county has 20 to 30,000 hunters and if they all put out bait, that would be a lot of places for the deer to congregate. If that county is anywhere near average, they have 20,000 deer in that county. 20,000 bait piles, 20,000 deer, perfect scenario. No transmission, no congregating, theoretically. That's the best possible option. If you only have a few sites, if you have that combine that spilled corn and you have that apple tree and you have a few sites, you're gonna get higher levels of concentration and more contact. We need to allow feeding and baiting for the better health of our long-term deer herd. It's a radical approach, but I think it kind of indicates that the sound science that the DNR is, is using to substantiate this is kind of has an agenda and has a bias to it. So I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I'd like to entertain any questions you might have. Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony thank today, you. sir. All right.